Well, welcome today to the ribbon cutting of the renovated Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I'm Garrett Jones, the Director of Parks and Recreation, and it is an honor to facilitate our ceremony here today. Unfortunately, the cloud cover is a little low today, but they're taking a rain check. We were going to have the historic flight foundation of Feltz Field salute all the veterans with the oldest airworthy example of the B-25 Mitchell bomber made immortal in the Doolittle Raid of April 1942. Flying the four corners, they were going to cross in, in perpendicular passes. The crew of John Sessions and Jay Pemberton were going to depart from the west in a spiral. This was going to be one of seven today in Veterans Day of 2021, but we'll take a rain check. But we'd just like to thank their commitment for today and helping us. So thank you to the Honor Flight. Next, please welcome Don Walski, the Army veteran and the artistic director of the Inland Northwest Opera to sing the national anthem. Thank you, it's an honor to be here today. I salute you all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the Thank you, Don. Next, please welcome Wesley Anderson, the State Chaplain of Veterans of Foreign Wars, for a prayer. Good morning. Let us bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we are gathered this day to dedicate this monument as an important and prominent part of the city of Spokane. Father, we ask thy blessing upon this monument we pray that thou wilt watch over and protect it from the elements and the devastation of time. May those who visit here be able to feel peace in their hearts. May they find these hallowed grounds to be a place of reflection and inspiration for freedom and a legacy for future generations. May we never forget the great and costly sacrifice made by those who gave their lives in the defense of freedom. Father, we also pray for those who have not yet been able to leave behind their demons of war. Please convey peace to their hearts and allow them to enjoy their futures and help them to leave war in the past. We also dedicate this monument as a tribute to the great veterans from all wars from Spokane, Washington. Veterans who once signed their names to a blank check made payable to the United States of America for an amount up to and including their lives. Unfortunately, far too many of these checks 
were redeemed for their full value. Father, we pray that those veterans are now at peace in paradise. We now rededicate on this day, November 11th, 2021, this Inland Northwest Veterans Memorial to those who served and to those who gave their lives and are now in the hands of God. May God bless the United States of America. In his holy name we pray, and they all said amen. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Today will mark the completion of a renovation work done to this important memorial. We all here for several speakers, including those who helped ensure that the memorial was built in 1985 and who ensured the renovation today. At the conclusion of the remarks, we'll cut a ribbon and invite those who wish to lay a rose at the memorial to do so. Before I wa welcome our first speaker, I'd like to recognize two special guests in the audience from Air uh, Fairchild Air Force Base. Colonel Cassius Bentley is the 92nd Air Refueling Wing Commander and Chief Master Sergeant Daniel Guzman is the 92nd Air Refueling Wing Command Chief. Thank you for being here. And I know also we were going to welcome uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers as well. So if you've made it in the audience, we welcome you uh, to today's event. So thank you again, Colonel Bentley, Chief Master Sergeant and Congresswoman for your support and being here with us today. Now please welcome Mayor Nadine Woodward to share some words of appreciation of our veterans. Thank you, Garrett. I just want to start by thanking uh, all the veterans who are here today. What an incredible crowd we have here. I am so proud of all of you, those who have served across all military branches for your service to our great country. The 11th day of the 11th month is recognized as Veterans Day, a time of remembrance, a time of reflection, a time for honoring you and all of those who have taken the oath to defend our nation. Today in our beautiful Riverfront Park, despite the damp weather, we commemorate the renovation of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It's a special moment to recognize and remember all of our Vietnam veterans, and especially those brave soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice. This important memorial has been in our park for 36 years, thanks to an original group of community members and donors. It is a beautiful bronze statue designed by Deborah Copenhaver Fellows and depicts a soldier holding a letter. The names of deceased Vietnam veterans from the Spokane area are engraved in the sculpture's pedestal as a lasting tribute to local heroes. And now, thanks to a dedicated group of veterans and very generous donors, this beloved memorial has been renovated and restored, cleaned and polished and all of its cracks repaired. The renovation added several amenities to the space, including a decorative handrail with uh, military medallions, some benches, flagpoles, an expanded plaza, and new plantings to enhance the greenscape. The project was driven by a committed group of local veterans who work with our Parks Department to prioritize those improvements, and generous donors who stepped up to make sure that those renovations were funded. Our Park Board President, Jennifer Ogden, will recognize those important individuals and organizations in just a minute. A community investment to ensure that those names that are etched into this memorial, those who gave their lives defending our country during the Vietnam War, are honored and remembered today and every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Next, please welcome our Park Board President, Jennifer Ogden, to thank our partners and donors for this wonderful project. What a privilege it is to be here to do this today. Thank you. It is also a privilege to honor and thank our veterans for their sacrifice and service to our country. As the Mayor said, we can't do that enough, and we should do that and do do it every day in our thoughts. One of our members here from the Department of Veteran Affairs, Washington State level, said, this is what's beautiful about America, service. You all are beautiful to us. 
These important renovations to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial could not have happened without a dedicated group of veterans, community members, and donors coming together with the Park Department and the Park Board. We are grateful for their collaboration, their input, and their financial support. Thank you to the veterans of the Inland Northwest Vietnam Veterans Memor Memorial Revitalization Committee, a group as strong as their name, who spearheaded this important work. Thank you also to the Washington State Department of Veteran Affairs. These two groups identified priorities for the renovation and provided us valuable feedback along the way. The financing of this began in 2019 with an initial fundraising effort through the Our Town Gala hosted by former Mayor David Condon, himself a veteran, and his wife Kristen. I see Kristen in the audience and I know David's here. <laughs> there you are. All right. Thank you to the Condon family and the donors of the 2019 Our Town Gala who gave substantially to get this off the ground and ensure the foundation financially for this project. Additional donors. Garco Construction and their subcontractors, Power City Electric and Clearwater Summit Group. Garco donated so much of their time and materials to this veterans project because it's personal. Tim Welsh, their CEO, and project manager Steve LaRue both served in Vietnam, and Garco has many other veterans on their team. Thank you, Garco. Global Credit Union offered generous support to get us to the finish line, and they have a reputation for supporting our community's military. When the initial plans for this first came up in front of the park board, we said, boy, this is great, but wouldn't it be great to do it all the way, all the way to the final beautiful rendition? And Global Credit Union stepped up and said, let's finish the race, and they made it happen. The Inovia Foundation provided support as the fiscal agent for much of the fundraising. Thank you, Inovia. Spokane County and Eastern Washington Regional Veterans Services were both collaborators and donors. We couldn't have done it without them. Thank you. Spokane Indians Baseball Operation Fly Together Campaign, which helps better the lives of veterans that have settled in the Spokane region, played a key role in ensuring we would complete the renovation. Thank you. And Bernardo Wills Architects, thank you for donating the beautiful and thoughtful design for the renovations. You see, the donation of the design is a major cost savings for us. Everybody pitched in as partners to make this happen. Please join me in thanking our donors and partners who helped to make this the best that, it's, that it can be. It's important to get it right. Together, we honor and thank our veterans. We will never forget you. Thank you, Jennifer. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Mike Fix-Simmons. In the early 1980s, Mike served as the chairman of the Inland Northwest Veterans, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Committee, who led the charge to build this memorial. You may also know Mike from his career as a radio and television broadcast journalist and a commentator and an instructor, an instructor at Gonzaga University. So please welcome Mike. What a difference 36 years makes, huh? <laughs> years ago, the uh, public sentiment toward uh, our men and women in uniform wasn't quite what it is today. Quite different indeed. We didn't have a wounded warrior fund. We didn't have a, a tunnels to tower organization. We didn't have a lot of even uh, significant interest from the Veterans Administration in the vets that came home. It was a different time indeed, and fortunately it is behind us. Vietnam vets, let's face it, simply were not properly welcomed home. They were not. All right? That was our error as a society, and we're making amends and have been ever since. Our proposal back in 1981-82 uh, to um, erect a monument met with mixed reception. Tough sell. It was a tough sell. It turned eventually, but it was a tough sell going in. There was resentment. There was resistance to it. I mean, I was tossed out of several offices of some prominent companies in this town and decided that they didn't, didn't want to participate in the deal. 
fortunately, as you heard from the litany of companies who participated in this renovation, that has all changed. That has all changed, fortunately. Deborah Copenhaver Fellows, whom uh, the mayor mentioned, uh, was hoping to get up here. She couldn't make arrangements to do it, unfortunately. But I remember our conversations with her. She is, as you know, an Inland Northwest uh, artist, uh, a gifted artist who came from just west of Spokane, out in the Palouse, the, uh, near uh, Reardon, Davenport area. And you'll notice when you see the bronze, if you have it already, that this is a soldier, but this soldier is not armed. No armament at all. The canteen is there, a few other items. But the whole idea, and this was Deborah's concept, was that this should be a moment of contemplation, not something that celebrated armament and power and war. And that's what it is. The soldier is engaged in, con in contemplation. He holds this letter. What's on that letter? That's up to you. A lot of you veterans have read letters like that. A lot of you uh, family members of veterans, particularly the Gold Star families, have written letters like that. You know what's on that, that letter. The contents of the letter was designed essentially to come from the mind of the viewer such that it allows the possibility of healing. And that's what it was all about, healing. Countless Vietnam veterans, moms, dads of veterans, children of veterans, siblings of veterans have visited this place in the last 36 years to find healing. In fact, they were doing it as we were putting that statue in the ground. They were coming out of the woodwork literally and leaving symbols of their lives, if you will, baby shoes, various other things that were there. They were, they were there watching us build this at the time. I remember the large crowd that attended the dedication ceremony 36 years ago. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. Veterans Day, 1985, dawn without a cloud in the sky. Crystal clear, but a whole lot colder than it is today. 10 degrees above zero was the temperature at dedication time. I remember the reverent color guard. It was almost like they were presenting the colors at a at a funeral. It was, it was not like this was a, a, a dedication. It was like this was a, a solemn moment of remembrance, which is what it was supposed to be. I remember the flyover of helicopters who then executed the missing man formation that day. I remember the powerful rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic sung by a church choir downtown. And I remember the solemn reading of each of the over 300 names that appear on this memorial. And I remember the percussionauts. Do you remember them? Yeah. In their colonial uniforms, thin fabric, 10 above zero, freezing to death and shaking, but they never once, they never once moved out of formation. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And I remember thinking then, as I emceed the dedication 36 years ago, as I do still, that this is a fitting tribute to those who served and to those, as the memorial says itself, who gave their lives and are now, no, now in the hands of God. And I thank everyone who has come to the uh, aid of the memorial and uh, renovated it and given it another 36 years or perhaps a long, long time to come. And I hope such renovations occur in the future because these things are fragile to some extent. But the fact that this is a tribute to the change in, in the hearts and minds of people is a very, very warm thing to me. And I'm sure that those of us who uh, were on the original uh, in the Northwest Vietnam Veterans um, Memorial Project are grateful for the fact that you folks have supported it for so long and want it supported for the future. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Fitzsimmons. And I would like to recognize Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers has arrived. So thank you, Congresswoman, for being here and supporting us today. Next, I would like to invite a number, another member of the original Memorial Committee to the microphone, Mr. Fred Arano. Mr. Arano deployed to Vietnam in December of 1967. 
where he served in the Army as a rifle company platoon leader, company executive officer, and acted as a rifle company commander. He later practiced law and was appointed to the Spokane County Superior Court while continuing his military service in the U.S. Army Reserve. He retired as a colonel after 32 years of Army service and has since served in a variety of volunteer activities for the Army Reserve, the court, and the law school. He was one of the key fundraisers for the original memorial and is a member of the committee who led the renovation today. So glad to see so many of the original people who worked on this. I see Tim Wells from Garco down there, our friend, and, and uh, a major, not just a fundraiser, but a, a heartfelt Vietnam vet has been with us all the way. I also see our Washington State Director of Veterans Affairs, Alfie Romero, sitting right there. So <laughs> you thought you'd slid under the radar, hadn't you, Ralph? No. <laughs> No, I was. Uh, I, I went through Gonzaga's ROTC program and was commissioned into the Army. And eight months, nine months after I left the university, in the meantime, I'd gone to Fort Benning and gone through the infantry school training for boys. It was boys only then. The Ranger and Airborne courses and all that stuff. And I went to Vietnam and had a tour that lasted for a year through some exciting times, as many of us did here. Um, I had a funny, I, I'm going to tell you a couple of personal things about how this fundraising stuff came about. I mean, it was 36 years ago today on this very spot that we did this thing. After a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth to raise the money with some heroic participations, which we'll mention here, the Sheraton right across the river over there was the old Sheraton. I went in there for lunch one day after I'd been in law practice for several years. As I went in there often, it was a pretty good place to have lunch. And I walked, I came upon the statue in the middle of the lobby. And I, I looked at it and couldn't figure out what it was. And I asked somebody, says, that's the Vietnam Memorial. And I, I've been there for years, practicing law in the middle of things in town and never heard of it. And I mean, I was just delightfully shocked, I guess. And the person that told me about it pointed to a table with certain people sitting at it, like Mike and a group of others. 10, about 10 volunteers that had been doing all of the grunt work. And this was like 1985, and they'd been starting it. Mike, when did you guys start? About 81. Yeah, and it's a night since 1981. And we had a bill for the, the statue for 100,000 bucks. Now, Debbie Copenhaver, who made this sculpture, also built the Gonzaga uh, <coughs> Bing Crosby statue. So if you want a reference point of something else, other work of hers, that was that was it and she was terrific with us all the way through she picked this site and she this is why we put it here it was primarily because this seemed to be the emblem of of why she built this thing so we're glad for that and that happened and my when I've been I went over and introduced myself to the committee and I told them that I was a vet and I was also a lawyer and, and they, <laughs> they looked at me kind of funny and he said, that's funny because we got a hearing with the park board in three days. <laughs> Date, not three. It might as well have been three hours as far as I was concerned, but three days to go to the park board about where we're going to put this thing. At that time, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, it was going to be placed under the north end of the, of the uh, Monroe Street Bridge. Now, there's just like nothing there, but they had some other things that were going to put down. I realized there were no memorials at all at that time over here near the arena. So that was the default place. We're going to get stuck under the north end of the, of the bridge. That didn't resonate well with anybody. So I got handed the ball and said, uh, can you go down and talk to the park board? So I did. Went down there and gave this much of the same story we're telling here, only kind of reached back a little further. And they agreed to move it to the park. The only question was where. And after we got Debbie's input, we got them to agree to put it where it is. So that's how the that's how it moved through the how it moved through the fundraising was really interesting as Mike has mentioned others have mentioned we had some heroic assistance 
uh, from people you've heard mentioned here, but there's one you haven't heard about. I remember after uh, uh, I ran into Jack Pring, and for many of you, there are many people here in town who know who Jack Pring is, and was the great uh, magnate of auto sales in, uh, in the Valley particularly. He had five different dealerships, I think. And, and I knew Jack because he was a vet. And I, he said, Fred, can you come out and talk to the, my guys? And I, I didn't hit him up for money when I talked to him, but he asked me to come out and talk to his guys. And I thought, well, okay, sure. And we'll go anywhere to talk about this memorial anytime. So went out, to, I don't even remember the venue, but it was big and there were hundreds, hundreds of people sitting out there. Jack Spring had bought, had bought all of his sales staff, maintenance people, office workers and everybody, had them sitting in this venue and we gave the, the pitch. I gave the pitch about the memorial and what the, what the work was. And afterwards, he made a commitment in front of everybody that he was going to do five bucks for every car sold over the next 60 days. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when you got five dealerships, you know, well, that sounded great. And then when that time ran, he wrote a check for 30,000 bucks. And he, I think he gave it to Mike. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think his name was on it, but Vietnam Memorial Fund. And we owed, that was the balance that we owed Debbie Copenhaver. So after all those years, we got as far as September before we had run out. We were run out of time to pay her before we were going to put that thing over there. So when I say that thing, bless it. Bottom line is we got it done. And uh, Jack Pring is awesome about it. So that was a huge deal to see that happen. But I wanted to tell you about the, the way the fundraising happened for years was put that thing on a trailer and take it around to Odessa or Reardon or up north. We go up to Colville and Chewila and out in the prairie someplace. We went everywhere to the parks, the counties, the little county fairs and talked about it. But it was always a dollar at a time, you know, what you could get collected during the course of that day. And I, <laughs> the thing that, was, that helped me get through all of this, because I, I was a professional soldier and the Vietnam War was just the war that I had to go fight at that time. It wasn't like it was for most other folks. But in the back of all of these little speeches, we'd have people talk, I'd talk to people and the crowd would break up and they'd move apart. And I'd see, always see one or two guys standing with their hands thrust in their pockets, kind of staring at the ground, but they hadn't left. And I walked up to these guys, hey man, what's happening? What can we do? Can, you answer, can we answer any questions for you? And he'd mutter something like, my, my name is John Smith and I'm a Vietnam veteran. It was almost like they were standing up in a room full of people they didn't know saying they were alcoholics. That was the stigma. And that was 10 years after the Vietnam War. So when Mike talks about not exactly hostile environments, but close at times to go raise money, the, it was there. It was hard, but people persevered. And it, but for the people like Jack Pring and several others, several that are here today that made this all happen. So just wanted to give you an idea of how, uh, what the environment was at that time and how it kept moving forward. Uh, Bob Hope had started, uh, had made the one in the park uh, in DC happen, the wall, and with several other really key people. And there was an article in National Geographic that summer of 85. And I read that article and it had a, it was a virtual template about how they did this, how they raised the money, all of the contacts they made and how they went about it. And it was great. It was a, wow, we can do this here. We just need to apply it. So we did things like getting money from people was one thing, but putting their names on letterheads and circulating and meeting and, and making, keep them moving. So that was really something. And the, the wall, for those of you who've seen it, it speaks for itself. Now, no one turned us down when we went around and asked them to put their name on a letterhead. I think we have our, had our U.S. senators on it at the time. I think we had the governor on it at, at that time. Um, a lot of people that we had on our letterhead of our uh, Vietnam Memorial Fund. But the, uh, to tell you, I'm going to tell you the, the, the a final little story that it was very personal to me, and I think it's happened to a lot of us. It would happen right here, 36 years ago, as it's been so described, it was icy cold out, 
and the wind was blowing and it was getting close to the speech time that's going on like now and I walked up and down this long list of flags we had people with all of the flags of all of their organizations there the Boy Scouts Girl Scouts uh, the the Air Force folks had their stuff here everybody had their colors and so it was this magnificent display over a hundred different organizations had their flags flying in this wind and it was cold and they were all standing out there and I went up and down that one more time to see if anybody needed anything before we started the speeches. And I walked up on this one old, gnarly looking dude. And I, I've used that phrase and I went and looked in the mirror the other day and said, I'm him now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, went, I, I could see that he was, and he was holding his, and I think it was VFW, I'm not sure. But he's holding his flag and he's, I see, I look at him and he's got, medals and ribbons all over his uniform I stopped and walked over to him and took a look up and down and I saw you know a silver star and bronze stars and combat infantryman badge and uh, I think he's a 101st airborne guy so we looked at all these things and I thought oh I looked at him and goes that's all I did just nod my head he cocked his head a little bit he looked at me he looked him down my uniform and I saw virtually everything on my uniform that he had on his And he nodded his head like that. And that was my welcome home from Vietnam. It still makes me. Yeah, this is 10 years after we got back and 15 after I got back. So, you know, the idea about being this hardcore professional soldier only goes so far. I found that one out. And it isn't quite the whole story. About two years ago, it was in 2019, there was an effort by certain organizations to move this location, to move the statue and the location of the memorial over to the arena. Because by that time, we had a lot of other uh, memorials, and nice ones that are sitting over there now. But the Vietnam vets really didn't want any of that. What they have there, as has been described, is a contemplative statue to think about Vietnam and their families. And nobody among the veterans, there was a few people in vets that said, we wanted to move it because they're like me. They have a problem with, with mobility, so they, they, uh, they wanted to have it closer. But I got asked again by Hal McGlathery, the former park uh, manager here, uh, to, you gotta go over and talk, explain it to him at the park board. We don't wanna move this. So 36 years, 30 years after I'd done it once before, I got to ask to go over and talk to Park Board, which I did. And Matt Shea is there, bless his heart. He gave his pitch about moving it. And I got to go up and explain to him that no, it didn't need to be moved. And, and Matt didn't know that I was there, that anybody was there that, to speak against it. But I went through the same recitation that I did with you and a lot of what Mike was talking about. Bottom line is not only did they they, they came up with a bunch of money at that time that has since been added to to make all of this happen. But they kept it there in perpetuity uh, and agreed to do a lot of the renovations and park signs to uh, how to get here and find this place, put lights up and do all those things. The bottom line, it was very proud to have been a part of all of this. Um, and Fiona Dixon's here someplace hiding. She's the work, the work for the park board, to, or pardon me, uh, for, yeah, for the park department to make this happen. Bottom line, she's done a great job. Park Department has too. And Hal McLathery, my buddy, he's out here. Thank you for keeping the spurs to all of us, Hal, to make this happen. Bottom line, thank you all very much for being here and honoring our vets and for honoring and, and coming back and sharing with us this wonderful memorial. It speaks for itself. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Arno. Now please welcome Mr. Rufus Hofer. Mr. Hofer entered the military in January of 1963 and served in Vietnam from September of 1967 to September of 1968 as a registrar in the 2D Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, the 55th Medical Group, the 7th Medical Command, and a hospital, hospital located near the front lines providing emergency life-saving surgeries to stabilize patients before they were transferred to other hospitals. 
He retired from the military in 1984 and worked in the executive health care roles. He has also served on the Governor's Veterans Affairs Advisory Committee, Spokane County Veterans Advisory Board, and the Spokane Regional Stabilization Center Work Group, and is, is now the immediate past president of the Spokane Chapter of the Military Offer, Officers Association of America. If I repeat some of the things that you've heard already, I've only been here in Spokane for 16 years. I moved up here from San Antonio, Texas, where it's probably about 75 today. But I had to do some Googling to look up some history, and I think whoever wrote the Google thing just spoke. So if I you hear it again, forgive me. I wanted to go back just a, a quick thing because I had to, I remember Veterans Day as a kid in and around Chicago with my parents in 1945, 46. And I remember the parade and you couldn't see the end of the soldiers. It was that, and everybody it was three or four deep, flags, everything. But so I remembered when and I think Nadine said it, the 11th hour, the 11th uh, month. Uh, in 1919, they signed the armistice, which ended the war in 1918. And something I didn't know, thanks to a congressman, we do have to thank our congressmen and women every once in a while. <laughs> thanks to a congressman in Kansas, in 1954, they changed it from Armistice Day to Veterans Day. Do you all remember? Not all of you. Some of you remember Armistice Day? Well, Dwight Eisenhower thought that sounded better. He signed it into law. And we've heard the horrors and deprivations of the World War II era were starting to fade, replaced by new feelings of nostalgia. People were missing the intense feelings of national solidarity and purpose. And in that year, 1954, one of the most popular films of all times, White Christmas, with our Bing Crosby, renewed the sentimental reminiscence of the war. Now, so brief numbers, which I had to put together, and I don't know whether I can say they're exact. 18.2 million veterans in the United States now. 7.3% of the entire population. About 9 million, or about 50%, are 65 or above. Many of them are here today. <laughs> they represent Korea, a few left from World War II, and Vietnam. The period of Vietnam, we had 3 million Americans serving. We lost 60,000 soldiers, and we had 150,000 wounded. And we honor the 300 whose names appear here. My year in Vietnam, I was a medic. I didn't go in the foxhole. I went as far away from the foxhole as you could get. I arrived in country in September of 67, and I left in 68. It was the second mobile army surgical hospital. You probably know that better as a MASH. Remember that one? It was located in Chu Lai. And I've seen lots of people here from the 101st, the 82nd. We served them, and I only knew them because I saw them coming in the door. I was not a surgeon. I took care of the clothes, admitted them, discharged them, transferred them to the airport, made sure they had a medical record. And, all, and our average length of stay at that hospital was 0.9 days. We were evacuating people out of that hospital still under anesthesia. That's how quick. But two things I'd like to leave with you about Vietnam, my experience, and it wasn't what we saw, the gruesome things. One of them was, and that choked me up, the look on the faces of severely injured soldiers 
looking up from a litter into the eyes of an American nurse. And it's just more than I can describe. They just absolutely went quiet. It was, I don't know whether that was their sister, their mother, their, they were home. Everything just quieted down. The other thing that I had to do was periodically, you know, once every couple of days, was to walk around the wards with a commander in pin purple hearts on pajamas or pillowcase. And I couldn't get over how every one of these young men said, Sir, I need to get back to my unit as fast as I can go. And here I am, everywhere I'm going, I got a short timer's calendar. You know, one more day left and you leave, these guys can hardly wait to get back. And they would salute us with one hand because they didn't have the other one. Those are what I remember there. The memorial, I just heard the history of it. Some of the things that I found were talked about. But Gary Henderson, who before the memorial was installed, do you remember Gary? Yeah. He drove around the community, put the memorial in a truck with the plastic boxes to gather money. They had boxes in the 7-Elevens and they had them in the Pizza Huts. So now I know, now that I've heard the rest of the story, where all of this money came from. I've heard about Deborah Cope and Evan Fellows. I'm glad it was dedicated in 1985, 10 degrees. <laughs> I don't think I'd have made it. But as a vet of Vietnam, let me just give you a few of my thoughts. I want to thank you and praise you, this community's outpouring of support for this beautiful statue and for placing it in this dignified, reverent, and truly appropriate setting. I think a tip of the hat to the current and the immediate past city and county administrations for their support and push to bring this much needed refurbishment to fruition. A special thanks to Wes Anderson, who visited this memorial, I don't know how many years, but a long time, a former U.S. Marine, and cleaned the gunk off the old one. And also, a day late, but a happy 246th birthday to the U.S. Marine Corps. Semper Fi! As I mentioned earlier, the intense feelings of national solidarity surrounding World War II and the earlier Veterans Day parades, which I remember as a kid, are gone. For us who served in Vietnam, that connection between civilian and soldier has always been somewhat strained. And I hope that this memorial, its simplicity, its dignity, and its peaceful location will all aid in the continuing dilution of any lingering feelings of resentment. As so well stated by Rod Cowder, on the online producer for the Spokesman Review, I saw this quote the other day, everyone who has served downrange knows that there's a thin margin between celebrating Veterans Day and being remembered on Memorial Day. And let me end with a paraphrasing of a quote I found. Faith is not wanting to stay in the shadow of a memorial, but an endless pilgrimage of the heart. I ask you please to return here often. Thanks to you all, especially those who served. Thank you, Mr. Hofer. Next, please welcome Stan Inzer of the Vietnam Veterans of America Spokane Chapter Number 879 to speak. Mr. Inzer is a member of the Renovation Committee and was in Vietnam with the 101st Airborne Division from June 1968 to June 1969. He was wounded December 19, 1969 from a Chinese Communist grenade, but refused medevac. He, was, he allowed the medic to patch him up so he could return to battle. Please welcome Mr. Inzer. I can't help but notice, Mayor Woodward, that you're a rogue amongst thorns here. <laughs> Am I right? 
many of us can acknowledge that the World War II veteran was the greatest generation. Yes. Amen. Yes. But I want to make a comparison between the Vietnam veteran, the South Pacific combat veteran in four years of war saw 40 days of combat. The Vietnam combat veteran in one year of service saw 240 days of combat. Is it any wonder we came home with baggage? Is it any wonder that many of us have come to alcoholism, drug abuse, the effects of Agent Orange, post-traumatic stress disorder? Memorial Day 2002, I had the opportunity to go to the wall in Washington, D.C. I met four of my brothers that I had served with in Vietnam at that wall. As I stood before that imposing black granite wall, I began tracing the name William G. Gaddy. The memory of September 29, 1968 flooded over me. We started that day off mid-morning, walked into an ambush, four wounded. That afternoon, we walked into an am another ambush. Willie Gaddy was instantly hit. He's laying down there screaming, medic, medic, I'm a, a medic, I'm injured. We're in the middle of a combat. We're fighting for our lives. As the automatic weapons fire calmed down, the last words that I heard from Willie Gaddy, Mama, Mama, I want my mama. As I stood before that wall, I began sobbing. The first tears that I had shed since my last combat death in 1969. I still shed tears for that. If it weren't for those four brothers standing there with me, I would have collapsed. About three, maybe four years ago, I had found out where this memorial was located, and I finally came up to see it. There was a bench sitting right over here, looking down over this grassy knoll towards the clock tower. There was a man about my age sitting on the bench there. I went over and I sat down beside him. He looked like he had the weight of the world on him. Well, as most conversations go between veterans, we just started dis discussing our histories. He was in Vietnam the same time I was, 1968-1969. He was a Marine Corps veteran. I'm an Army veteran. We laughed. We kidded each other a little bit. And then we started name dropping. Con Thien, Ashaw Valley, Phu Bai, Way, Firebase Birmingham, Camp Eagle. We began talking battles, and then we started talking lives lost. The tears flowed for both of us. As we sat there for about an hour and a half talking, it was time to leave. He stood up, started walking up the trail, and he came back and threw his arms around me, gave me a hug, and said, thank you. For the first time, somebody listened to me. As he walked up this path, he looked like he was walking a little bit lighter. And I remembered the words of that old song. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. It is my hope and my prayer that the Spokane Vietnam Veterans Memorial is a memorial of healing, a memorial of peace, remembrance, 
that we can come up here in quiet reflection. I stand before you today as a Vietnam veteran, a proud Vietnam veteran. I salute all of you veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Inzer. Please welcome back to the microphone our final speaker today, Wesley Anderson. Mr. Anderson was involved in both the original memorial and its renovation. He served in Vietnam from November 1966 to June of 1968 as a corpsman with the Marines. Since retiring from a manufacturing industry, Mr. Anderson collaborates with veterans and their families to ensure they receive the benefits they deserve. He is currently the state chaplain for the veterans of foreign wars. You gentlemen forgot about the five inches of snow that was on the ground that day. Yeah. Forgot about that. A little detail. <laughs> little detail. Yeah. Didn't it snow the night before? And we were out here shoveling snow to get yeah. the path cleaned yes. off. Yes. Forgot about that. In fact, uh, I would ride around with Mr. Hunter and we would empty out the change jars at the Pizza Huts, the 7-Elevens. Sherry's had one. Perkins had some. I mean, we, they were all over town. We would, we would spend probably 50 bucks in gas running around and collecting maybe two or three hundred dollars. But anyway... I, when uh, we started talking about the renovation, I wrote a little odd bud piece that uh, was in the Veterans Chronicle at that time. It was my thought as to what the memorial meant to me. High on a hill above the lilac bowl sits a lone figure. Who is he? We may never know. He is sitting here in mute testament to the soldiers, sailors, marines from the Spokane region who gave the last full measure during the Vietnam conflict. Looking out over the park and the city with a thousand yard stare. Those of us who have been there know all too well what that stare is. <clears throat> the memorial was erected to honor some 300 soldiers, sailors and marines who called the Inland Northwest home. Sitting in silence, he is guarding the names of the fallen. In his hand is a letter. Who is it from? We may never know. I would like to think it's from home, a wife, a mother, a girlfriend, telling him that all is well at home and for him to be safe. He sits in silence in a daydream thinking of his hometown. He sits staring out at his city a city he left long ago in hopes of one day to return. Did he return? We may never know. For some 34 years he has set in mute testament to America's finest from Spokane and the surrounding area who answered the call. A testament to those who did not return as they left, but also to those who did return. It has become a place of reflection for those of us who did return a place of quiet, quiet contemplation, a place to remember those we left behind, a place to find healing, a place where families can come and reconnect with their family members. He will sit nameless and unknown, but he will always sit watchful and vigilant watching over his city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. So at this time, we'd like to welcome our speakers and our donors that help us cut the ribbon today. While they're making their way up to the ribbon, I would like to thank you for being here with us today. And as a part of Parks and Recreation, we are so pleased with the collaborative work that happened. A group of dedicated veterans coming together, matched with generous donors, and together this important restoration was made possible. 
We honor and cherish our veterans, and this monument to Vietnam veterans has a very special place in our hearts here at Riverfront Park and will for many, many years to come. Thank you, Fiona. Nice job today. Thank you. Thanks for standing up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it looks like we're ready. So if we could all do a little countdown, three, two, one. All right, three, two, one. The, the renovated Vietnam Memorial is officially open and we invite you to take a rose and place at the memorial if you wish. We welcome veteran Phil Cowson playing taps on the bugle in honor for all our local veterans who lost their lives during the Vietnam War. Thank you for being here.